Gresham College presents Resetting the Human Compass, the Use and Value of the Arts by Sir Andrew Motion. Um, it's an honour to do this in this beautiful place, I must say, especially. It's an honour to do it, but it's an opportunity as well, and one that I'm very pleased to have been given. It's an opportunity to continue a valuable tradition that was sketched by the then Lord Mayor, Frederick Hoare, in 1962, at the beginning of the very first City of London Festival, when he said the festival existed in order to promote beautiful things. A nice, simple way of putting it. I'm going to think for the next 50 minutes about what beautiful things do for us. And in particular, I'm going to think about their value, and which is not the same thing, of course, their use. These are urgent questions at any time, but they're especially urgent and especially deserving of an answer at a moment in our history when great economic changes are afoot, when many of the institutions in which we have placed our trust now seem untrustworthy, and when many of the things we've been able to afford without much question now seem unaffordable. These changes have done in some respects great damage to many things that we hold dear and have laid great burdens on the lives of millions. But they also present us with a great opportunity if we choose to take it. I mean, they give us the opportunity to reset our compass as human beings. And thinking about that opportunity is what I'm going to do on this 50th anniversary of the festival. I'm going, as I say, to reflect on the ways in which the arts and culture might themselves set the direction of that compass that I've just mentioned. In the process, I'm going to reaffirm some of the things that I've said in other talks over the last few months, but I do this with excitement and thanks today for the context that you've given me. But there's a problem, or rather I think there are two problems. One is simply the difficulty of scale. The questions that I have set myself are really enormous mountains, and I'm not going to be able to climb to the top of them in less than an hour. So you must excuse me if I scramble from time to time. The other problem is less obvious and even more intractable. And it's this. All the issues that I've just raised are framed in abstract terms. And as a poet, I have very little ability to deal with abstract terms and very little interest in doing so either. In fact, like most of my brother and sister poets, I spend my life trying to avoid abstract terms or rather trying to turn them into physical and sensuous things. I do this for the same reason that Jesus told parables and that John Keats said axioms in philosophy are not axioms until they are proved upon our pulses, which is to say, like Jesus and John Keats, whom in other respects, alas, I resemble not at all, I know that the great majority of people understand things better when they feel the force of an argument in their guts rather than when they struggle to apprehend it in their heads. And I also know the best way to affect people in their guts is by speaking to them about and through things in themselves, through objects, through the life of the senses, and through personal revelation, rather than through airy generalities. Through poetry, in fact, and the other arts, and not through a formal lecture such as you've invited me to give. For these reasons, which, as you see, are a combination of things I feel able to do and things I think it is right and proper to do, I'm going to divide my talk into three sections. I'm going to begin by following one of the signposts I've just erected and speak personally about how the arts entered my life and about what they have come to mean to me, how they have set my compass and shaped my life. Then I'm going to think for a moment about how these personal terms connect with the larger world and with what opportunities are being taken and missed under the present dispensation. Then I'm going to look at three poems, poems by people other than myself, to see how they embody the values I shall be speaking about. My purpose is to create something that feels intimate, but at the same time makes large connections, because that's how art itself works, by speaking to us one-to-one -one and by establishing individual verities, which then join up and become a general truth. So I'll begin at the beginning with myself. I was born in 1952, a baby boomer who shares with many of my generation the sense of living on the sharp edge of a paradox. 
On the one hand, I feel I've had exceptional good fortune for the first two-thirds of my fourscore years and ten. No wars to fight as a young man, unlike my grandfather and my father, both of whom fought in world wars. A grant to study at university, which I was the first person in my family to do. Reasonably good em employment project prospects and the opportunity to join a decent pension scheme, which I, of course, failed to take, but at least I had the opportunity. <laughs> On the other hand, I feel likely to spend the last part of my life lamenting the legacy that my generation is bequeathing to our children. A fouled out banking system, a sick planet, and looming economic and faith wars. I expect to die feeling much less certain that there will be an end to human history than I did when I first began thinking seriously about history as a teenager. Mine was a standard middle-class rural upbringing in a village in East Anglia, about 20 minutes south of Constable's Dedham Vale, where my father's family has lived for three generations before I came along. A pretty place and a comfortable life. My father, like his father and his father's father, was a brewer and commuted to London every day. He hated that, not the work, but spending 10 hours a day in the smoke. He was a countryman and enjoyed doing country things. My mother went along with that more or less contentedly until at the age of 42 when she had an accident that put her in hospital where after nearly 10 years of suffering she died. Which is another story. For our purposes today I need to tell you that my mother read a bit, Aris Murdoch mainly, who conveniently published a novel every 12 months or so which took my mother all year to read. I think Aris Murdoch's writing speed and my mum's reading speed were more or less exactly the same. But my father read hardly at all. In fact, he used to say when wondering aloud how his eldest son had become poet laureate, with a very funny expression on his face, that he reckoned he'd read half a book in his life, which was The Lonely Skier by Hamid Innes, which somebody had told him was a thriller, but evidently he was not persuaded. <laughs> I don't say any of this to imply that the life of culture is the only life worth living. I don't think it is. Neither do I want to give the impression that I was brought up in a well-furnished ditch. I wasn't. But for reasons that are probably already apparent, I do at the very least want to say that my upbringing was not a bookish one. My father, in fact, thought that even talking was seriously overrated. And as for any form of communication that had been elaborated into art, well, that was just ridiculous, or embarrassing, or a waste of time. Theatre, for instance, Theatre meant an annual trip to London to see a show around Christmas time, usually a pantomime, which my father would impatiently sit through jiggling his foot, except for the year he'd, <laughs> this is true, though you won't believe it, except for the year he discovered an adaptation of Jorrocks, which he thought was a rare example of good taste in a generally ludicrous profession. Music, for instance. Music meant LPs of South Pacific, My Fair Lady, West Side Story. Painting, for instance. Painting meant nothing in the sense that painting simply didn't matter. We had hunting prints along the upstairs landing and reproductions of two Dutch still lives either side of the fireplace in the drawing room. These were so dull and so dark, I sometimes think my father must have chosen them solely as a means of recharging every night his animosity to the whole business of artistic rep representation. Ballet, for instance, but I don't think I need tell you. I want to repeat, none of this is meant to sound self-pitying. I was a happy child when I lived at home. Neither is it meant to sound superior and represent some sort of attack on my father, who knew plenty of things that I don't and whom I love dearly. But as you can see at a glance, there is a big difference between the life I was born into and the life I lead now. So what happened? The first thing that happened was a teacher, Peter Way was and is his name, who began teaching me English for A-level when I was 16. I still see him as much as I can. He's a very old man now, of course, but uh, a dear friend. I've spoken about him sometimes before, and I don't want to repeat myself here, but I do want to say that he walked straight into my head and turned them all the lights on. In our very first lesson together, we talked about Thomas Hardy's poem, I look into my glass, my looking glass, not my drink, which I felt go into me like a spear. After that, we read poems by, among others, Milton, Wordsworth, John Clare, Keats, Tennyson, Hardy, Edward Thomas, Auden, Larkin, Hughes, Seamus Heaney, whose first book had just been published. Over the years, 
These poets have kept their place, or do I mean they've been confirmed, as the writers who stand among those who mean most to me? Pretty obviously, this is because Peter Way imprinted them on my mind. Specifically, he made them feel a part of my life. Given what I've said about my upbringing, in which poetry was about as usual and welcome as cross-dressing, this was quite an achievement. His easier option would have been to present poetry as purely and simply a revolt against everything I'd previously known. And in some respects, it was a revolt. It wasn't noisy, aggressive, exclusively masculine, prejudiced, boneheaded, stubborn, reactionary, and self-satisfied, as most things and most people in my father's world seemed to me to be when I was a callow youth. When I was reading all these poets I've just named, and especially when I was reading Edward Thomas and Thomas Hardy, and others whose canvas was a countryside I felt I recognized, I felt simultaneously at home and away from home, an ideal mixture for someone of my temperament. Peter Way was a quiet genius. He laid the foundations of my adult life. Indeed, he gave me my life, really. But even he wouldn't have been able to work his magic without a network of other things supporting all that he did for me. One was a particular friend who came from a different and more professional background than my own, who, when I was this same age, 16, began taking me to art galleries and so on for the first time. He still is my closest friend, really, this man, and now runs the National Portrait Gallery. Sandy Nairn is his name. So there was him. And there was also the school library, where I spent most of my time when not in the classroom, until I left school at the age of 18, having ingeniously conjured up for myself a series of illnesses that prevented me from playing games. So there you have it. Peter Way gave me my life. My best friend was my mentor. And a library was my oxygen tent. All of them connecting in knowing and unknowing ways with another and much larger pattern of people and institutions and attitudes that comprise what we call the humanities. They had begun to produce in me a feeling that the arts were a peculiar mixture of refuge and vantage point and were therefore essential to my health and happiness. But to be honest, I don't think I'd yet done anything to theorize this feeling or to connect it with larger issues in any coherent way. That began to happen when I arrived at university in 1971 I went to University College, Oxford. For one thing, I soon met much cleverer people than any I'd met before, and through them started to discover a much larger country of writers and of subjects. But for all these differences of scale, the experience of literature that I had on my degree course felt pretty similar in essence to what I'd known at school, pretty similar in its estimation of what did and did not make for good criticism, and also pretty similar in its sense of audience and purpose. The sense, I mean, that while the arts might often gain their authority to speak about life by coming at it from a surprising angle, they still belong in life. They are not, or rather they should not be, a weird addition or a luxury or a privilege for the few. Saying so makes me feel this might be a good moment to pause and give a resume of what I can remember thinking about the value of the arts by the time I left university and started on my adult life. Essentially, I believed, and I still believe, that the value of the arts depends on a series of paradoxes. I've already begun to suggest this by saying they hit life at a surprising angle but are central to our experience. To elaborate a little, they make the familiar strange, they remind us of what we already know, they help us to enjoy and endure, in Samuel Johnson's great phrase, by challenging and even shocking us, as well as by more straightforwardly consoling us. And in the midst of all these things, they create what I think is the most imp important paradox of all. At the same time as they deepen our sense of ourselves, and thereby authorize, extend, confirm, and affirm us as individuals, they also allow us to see the world through eyes other than our own and to stand in other people's shoes. In this respect, they encourage a fundamentally liberal and democratic instinct. It's this, more than anything, that makes them a vital part of the existence we all share. If I sound a little hot under the collar as I say this, which I mean to do, 
It's not just because I believe it very passionately. It's also because I'm remembering how the mood of my student and immediately post-student times was broadly unsympathetic to such thoughts. Remember, I'm now talking about what we used to call, in fact still do call, the Thatcher era, when humanities departments and universities were routinely under attack, when grants for the arts were given parsimoniously and often administered in very unimaginative ways, when there was virtually no sense of what a cultural economy might be, and where the predominant political attitude to cultural life was benign indifference. I don't want to dwell on that part of recent history, but I do want to recall it as a way of beginning to explore what we find in our present, which is the second part of my talk. So let me begin this second part by saying that I understand very well that there are great differences between then and now, differences we might consider as having the potential to act as benefits and differences that have the potential to be problems. In the benefits column, we might include the fact that between 1997 and 2007, in those 10 years, the arts had a 70% increase in funding. And as a result of this, all kinds of old institutions were revitalized, Tate Modern, the South Bank, and a lot of vivacious new ones emerged, the Sage at Gateshead, the Lowry Center, and so on and so on. We might go on to say that as a result of this new investment and new valuing of the arts as a part of our national life, the whole arts economy started to flourish. It did. The figures speak for themselves. And it is one of the great successes of the new labor era, rather undersung by them, I think. It's an odd thing, that. I mean, they were besotted by spin, but they didn't spin one of their great success stories. By the time of the last election in 2010, there were two million people working in the creative sector, according to the DCMS. And these two million were contributing 60 million pounds a year to the economy a contribution that during New Labour's years in office had grown at twice the rate of the economy as a whole. Fantastic story. As I say, all this exists in the benefit column. But now I'm going to look at some of the problems that have come to light in our recent cultural history. And I'll begin by noticing that as soon as we start talking about the health of the arts economy, we raise the question of whether an instrumentalist approach to the arts is ever a good thing. By instrumentalist, I mean the kind of approach that Brian McMaster tried to resist in his celebrated report to the Arts Council in 2008. What kind of safeguards, he asked, can be provided for the less popular forms of high art, so-called, well, we all know what we mean by it, in which the quality of a thing cannot be reliably or even interestingly measured in terms of audience size? What kind of defense can be made for the research interest that produces no quick material return? What kind of justification can be made for university courses that have no particular use, even if they have a great value? What are the implications of the widespread rebranding of our universities and of our cultural industries as just that, as industries? What can be done about the way philanthropists, where they can be found at all, tend to support success stories, not risky ventures, and are inclined to concentrate their money on the metropolis? What do we think about the ways in which institutions place an increasingly heavy emphasis on the commercialization of intellectual life instead of cherishing universal knowledge and making what Matthew Arnold called the disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that has been known and thought in the world? So to recap, these are all questions which rose clearly into view when the economic going was good. Now the economic going is bad, they've become even more acute. To put them in a nutshell, and to place Coleridge alongside Matthew Arnold, where he belongs as someone who had especially interesting things to say about such matters, we very urgently have to ask ourselves how we protect what Coleridge called the civilization of the community from a regimen of outcomes, and how we defend the arts when funding for every kind of institution and organization in the cultural sector is being cut. Most commentators, when they speak about the, the cuts, begin by insisting that the arts should share the country's collective pain. I have to say, I have very divided feelings about this. A part of me thinks that because the arts are a part of life, they must share the same fate as everything else in life. Another part of me wants to daydream and wonder why the arts, which give so much in terms of human value, and which anyway have such an efficient microeconomy within the macroeconomy, can't be ring-fenced 
in the same way that foreign aid and national health are supposed to be ring-fenced? Why can't we, in fact, take a leaf out of Amartya Sen's book and start thinking about how to rank the nations of the world in terms of their cultural worth, not just their economic and or their military power? Why can't we insist that our national reputation should not anymore depend on the way we privilege bankers or go to war? Why can't we say that instead we want our reputation to rest on the way we care about the good quality of our citizens' lives and affirm that the arts and the humanities are the bedrock of that good quality? The realist in me knows that such a transformation in national image is unlikely, though I refuse to say impossible. But the same realist, in discussion with other aspects of my personality, also knows that a great deal more could be done to steer a path between pragmatism and idealism. Specifically, we could have a much more definite articulation by those in authority over us of the deep values of the country they govern. But when it comes to cultural matters, silence is usually all we get, even or especially from those who work in the Department of Government, which has the word culture in its title. None of us want governments which tell us how to live or governments which nanny us. But we do want leadership. And we do want politicians to take a manifest interest in things that profoundly affect the quality of our lives. And we do want them to take this chance to assert what other kinds of richness we might enjoy since the economy cannot deliver riches. And what do we get? Silence about such things. I don't just mean a habit of public speaking in which language is impoverished, though that is true. I mean no vision, no mapping of the high ground, nothing aspirational, nothing about what most profoundly matters to us as human beings. And on the few occasions this silence is broken, what do we hear then? News about very severe cuts to the Arts Council, news that the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council, which I used to be the chairman of, has been scrapped, news that the visionary Liz Forgan will not have her post renewed as the chair of the Arts Council. News that the culture of philanthropy the DCMS is supposed to be encouraging has shown precious little signs of coming into existence. In fact, the amount of private money coming into the arts since they announced that initiative has tanked. And so on, and so on, and so on. Sure, we've got the cultural Olympiad. And during the coming few weeks, I'm sure we'll see some interesting and entertaining things. But masterpieces that crystallize the occasion, durable artistic legacies, I'm willing to wait and see, of course, but I don't do so with much confidence. When the last cheer fades and the tracks are empty again, we'll be left with the same general impression of our cultural epoch, an epoch that saw the disappearance of fragile ecologies that took a great many years to evolve, that will be very difficult to revive and that we may therefore never see again. The festival, for instance, that's the creation of many separate individual efforts and community commitments the small press that published distinguished work that by its nature was bound to have a small audience, the research program that cannot guarantee a quick impact, the library, the library that is appropriated for some other use when it closes its doors and will not open as a library again. Shoot first, aim later. Say nothing at all or say nothing of value and everything about use. There's been far too much of all that in the recent past. And in my view, it represents a completely feeble response to the question of how to steer the arts through our time of financial difficulty. And of course, it begs the question, what can we do? Well, we can campaign, of course, about libraries, about arts funding, about student fees, about cuts to higher education, about the whole hideous bundle. But we can be articulate as well. We can explain why we value as well as what we value. And this is what brings me to the third and final part of my talk, in which I want to read you three short poems and say something about each of them. In doing so, I hope that I can give a physical reality to ideas that would seem diminished if I presented them in merely abstract terms. I can promise there's some water down here. There is, but I'm going to have to pour it out. That's why I spill a lot of water all over my trousers. Um, the first poem I'm going to read you is a sonnet. Actually, the first two poems I'm going to read you is a sonnet. By a contemporary poet that I especially like. Um, it's all the more remarkable since he's younger than me, and generally speaking, people are paranoid about people younger than themselves. Um, 
called Alice Oswald, who lives down outside Totnes in Devon. And this is a poem of hers called Wedding. From time to time, our love is like a sail. And when the sail begins to alternate from track to track, it's like a swallowtail. And when the swallow flies, it's like a coat. And if the coat is yours, it has a tear, like a wide mouth. And when the mouth begins to draw the wind, it's like a trumpeter. And when the trumpet blows, it blows like millions. And this, my love, when millions come and go beyond the need of us, is like a trick. And when the trick begins, it's like a toe tiptoeing on a rope, which is like luck. And when the luck begins, it's like a wedding, which is like love, which is like everything. Love, sail, swallowtail, coat, tear, mouth, tear, mouth, wind, trumpet, millions, trick, rope, luck, wedding, love, again, everything. The rush and change of the poem is its own point and makes us think first and foremost about transformations, about the changes that love creates and the changes that art creates as it takes hold of familiar experience, shines it up and passes it back to us as something deeper and refreshed. Refreshed by and for ourselves and also because it comes with a new awareness of living in a context, in a tradition even, of the kind that Eliot meant to summon up in his great essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, where he spoke about the historical sense, which is a sense of the timeless as well as the temporal, and of the timeless and of the temporal together. Surfing on the back of these changes and connections comes another sensation in the Alice Ossel poem, which is of course of exhilaration, deriving not just from the breathless catching of love's breathlessness, though that is very well caught, but from the sonnet seeming to be simultaneously vertiginous and balanced, like the type of walker we see in a glimpse. It allows us to hear a note of rapture in the final phrase, which is like everything. Even though the sequencing of the poem suggests this ending might be about to feed back into the beginning again, so the poem becomes a kind of miniature self-regenerating vortex, one that sweeps us up and keeps us aloft, but blows us about the world as well. And speaking of blowing about the world, here's my second poem, which is a well-known contemporary poem called Posterity by Seamus Heaney. As I say, another sonnet. And sometime, make the time to drive out west into County Clare along the flaggy shore in September or October, when the wind and the light are working off each other, so that the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter, and inland among stones, the surface of the slate gray lake is lit by the earth lightning of a flock of swans, their feathers ruffed and ruffling, white on white, their fully grown, headstrong looking heads tucked or cresting, or busy under water. Useless to think you'll park and capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there. A hurry through which known and strange things pass, as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways, and catch the heart off guard, and blow it open. In the Oswald poem, we had rapture and transformation in love. Here we have a wind blowing the heart open as the speaker of the poem forgets himself and becomes open to the world in which he exists. The world of seen things and of unseen things in which the predominant characteristic of being human, which is identified here as hurry, becomes not so much a damnable hastiness as a whirl of receptivity. Postscript, in other words, the title of the poem, is a poem that establishes its sense of the numinous of what lies beyond our easy imagining and our easy saying by earthing itself in a particular place as thoroughly as the, earth, as the swans are earthed, paradoxically, on their lake. Paradoxically, because a lake is made of water. 
Yet at the same time as Heaney establishes this connection, he also insists that he and all of us at such moments are neither here nor there. This little phrase, this very familiar phrase, confronts what I suppose is the most abiding, the most tormenting problem that we have to acknowledge as human beings. This problem, in expressing ourselves, we put ourselves outside ourselves because words can never be the same as feelings, however successfully they strive to capture feelings. This is partly what Keats meant to suggest when he tells us in the Ode on Melancholy that in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. It is our fate as humans to exist at one remove from our sensual selves because it is our evolved skill to be able to comment on ourselves. And not only at one remove from our sensual selves, but also from a completely satisfactory display of our articulate selves as well. I mean, speech, the thing that makes us what we are, and which distinguishes from most other creatures, all other creatures, and which we rightly hold so dear and understand is central to our humanity, is doomed always to do less than we want it to do. Fail better. That was Samuel Beckett's reason for continuing to write. To fail better. But the ambition and the frustration he catches here is part of an old song. And so is the way they combine to put us in our place as humans. To put us in our place in every sense of that phrase and in the way that only art can. I want to show you what I mean in the last poem I'm going to look at, which is one of Wordsworth's so-called Lucy poems. She dwelt among the untrodden ways. One of my favorite poems, as it happens. That's perhaps not a very surprising thing to say. The last line of this poem, one of the greatest and one of the simplest lines in all English poetry, registers a devastating loss, but admits, as it does so, that any more comprehensive account of grief is impossible. It is a very beautiful lyric, built on solid ground, indeed profoundly to do with being of the earth, but built above a huge subterranean cavern of silence. She dwelt among the untrodden ways, beside the springs of dove, a maid whom there were none to praise and very few to love, a violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown and few could know when Lucy ceased to be. But she is in her grave, and oh, the difference to me. Instead of responding to this poem with some lit crit as I've tried to do with the other two, I'm going to tell you a story. In the autumn of 1976, I went to teach English at the University of Hull. It was my first job. In one of my seminars, I talked to a group of new students, first year students, about Wordsworth and in particular about the poem I've just read to you. There was a clever young woman in the group whose name, unfortunately, I can't remember because I'd love to see what became of her, who took Wordsworth to task for the very simplicity that I've just praised. I told her she wasn't the first person to feel challenged by it and did my best to justify the poem. Apparently to no avail. Next week she wasn't there. And I assumed that she decided that English literature in general, and this Lucy poem in particular, was not for her. But I was too hasty. A fortnight later she was back and lingered after the seminar ended. She said she was sorry she'd missed the previous week. Her mother had died and she'd been home for the funeral. Without any prompting from me, she said she'd found herself repeating and repeating Wordsworth's poem in her head and had felt strengthened by it. Then she said a beautiful thing. It was, she said, as though the O oh of, oh, the difference to me, had been filled in. So there you have it. Three poems and three reminders of what happens to us when we read them. Reminders, in fact, of what happens to us all when we all read good poems and good novels, which is akin to what happens to us when we see something good at the theater or the ballet or the movies, which is in turn the foundation of why we care about the arts in general. And not only about the arts, 
but about the many different kinds of institution and organization and activity that feed and embody the humanities, the libraries and the research centers, the universities, the museums and archives. You will all have your own instances and examples. You will have your examples and you will have your own way of expressing their value. For my own part, let me say this. The arts and the humanities associated with them provide us with the paradoxes that we depend on for the realization and fulfillment of ourselves as human beings. Nothing less. They stretch us while reminding us of our shortcomings and our fallings short. They give us intense and durable pleasures while at the same time testing and provoking us. They are the means by which we learn to live more deeply as individuals, but they are also the echo chambers in which we begin to understand what it means to live in history. They pay attention to events, but they make their own narrative of those events and sometimes establish themselves at an interesting distance in order to understand them more deeply. They teach us about ourselves while they allow us to forget ourselves and just as fulfillingly to identify with others. They affirm the value of oblique truths as well as the usefulness of direct utterance. They honor familiar life while transfiguring it. And they give us the clearest possible view of what lies beyond our powers of seeing and of saying. They help us to continue living well because they keep death in view. Are these self-evident truths? I would say so. But this doesn't mean we are excused from cherishing and broadcasting them. In fact, at times like these, we need to do so more urgently than ever. The true wealth of ourselves and of our society depends on it. Thank you for listening to me. There's a microphone being handed to somebody. Yes, far away. I, I wonder if I can ask you, you started off talking about truth at the individual level and talked about truth at the collective level. And you ended up with a very interesting little phrase, self-evident truths. When it comes to value at an individual level and value at a collective level, can you comment on whether there's such a thing as self-evident value which is generally appreciated? Well, that's a very rich question. Did everybody hear it? Um, I'm not sure that I have very much to say about that that you wouldn't find more interestingly put by other people in the room, but with that proviso, um, and standing back from it a little bit in order to create a context for it, the distinction that I was, of course, trying to make between use and value was really between instrumentalism and something to do with the spirit, for want of a better word, though that seems to me rather a good word to, to use about it. Um, and I think it can be rather difficult to, for all kinds of good democratic humane reasons, to characterize a common spiritual value in any precise and definite terms because you're going to, lose somebody, because you're going to leave somebody out of the account. And the whole point of establishing that distinction between use and value in the first place is not to do that when you're talking about, about value. But I do think that, nevertheless, it's, it is possible to establish certain ideas about how we would prefer to live as human beings, which people would more or less reasonably sign up to, which is clearly a combination of how to live effectively, efficiently, and caringly in a material way in the present, and also keep our sights set on the larger values which give a dignity um, and a dimension to our day-to-day -day activities that lift them above the merely ordinary. I mean, I realize that I'm now beginning to talk in rather abstract language as I say that, but that, that's, I think, how I would characterize it to myself. Um, the value of abstract consideration of these things, or the value of using abstract language to speak about them, of course, is that um, it's, theoretically, at least, it does allow you to leave things loose enough to everybody to, to join in with it. The danger, equally obviously, no doubt, is that you end up 
speaking rather fluffily so that nobody quite knows what you mean. I hope I don't need to rehearse what I mean because I hope that the lecture made clear what I do believe in and, and value and so on. But I think I would summarize it as I've just done as having to do with living in the here and now and also keeping our eye on the big, the big stuff. But it's a very interesting question, I think. The schoolmaster you talked about at the beginning yes. had a huge effect on you. I don't know whether he had a similar effect on other people, but it obviously is um, something very important. I wonder whether you have some things to say about how he achieved that, and presumably he didn't just brainwash you into liking the poets. <laughs> he liked. Maybe um, he did. <laughs> no, I'd love to talk about him. Um, Peter Way. Um, the f this, I have to begin by telling you a joke which still makes me smile, though it's now 40 and some 45 years later since this, uh, the first time he, the first lesson that I had with him. Are you an English teacher yourself? By any chance? No, I wondered. Um, this first poem that we looked at together was this poem by Thomas Hardy, I look into my glass, I look into my glass and view my wasting skin. It's a very beautiful little poem about Hardy, I mean Hardy writes all his poems as an old man of course, because poems are what he comes to later in his life. Um, and even though it's quite an, an early Hardy poem, it's still, he's still quite an old man when he writes it. Um, and it's a poem, for those of you who don't know it, about, it's a little lament really, written by an old man um, who is suffering the pangs that he associates with youth in his old man's body because he can't kind of act on them anymore. And the last verse of it, if I can remember it, goes, but time to make me grieve, part steals, in other words, takes away bits of the body, lets part abide, the original promptings, um, and shakes this fragile frame at eve with throbbings of noontide. That's, how, that's the last verse of the poem. Um, and I, was, I remember I was sitting next to a boy called Nixon, I wonder what happened to him. Um, it's probably Lord Mayor of London, uh, <laughs> who immediately stuck his hand up after we'd first read this poem through and said, Sir, 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 um, what, is, what is this throbbing? <laughs> which at the time seemed a sort of tremendously embarrassing question, but of course it was a, absolutely the question to ask because that's, that was all the kind of young man stuff captured in that, in that word. Um, we recovered from that somehow or other. I think what he, I mean I mentioned in the talk as you won't have forgotten that he managed to build a bridge between things I knew and things that I wanted to find out. He didn't just sort of rip me off into a whole new universe. He did make a connection between the world that I'd been brought up in and the world that poetry was able to present to me. That, that was important for me. Um, because what it, although I'd never, this phrase didn't occur to me at the time, but with hindsight, I can see that what it did was to establish in me something that has been very important in the way that I've tried to live my life and indeed in the way that I've tried to write, which is the phrase I kept coming back to, which is that poetry belongs in life. It's not a weird bolt on, it's not an extension, it's not a kind of optional extra, it's like breathing. That's, that's what that connection gave me to understand. But at a, a slightly more technical, formal, more at least linguistic level, what he made me feel, and I think it is connected to the point that I've just made, is that he made me fall in love with poetic language, which on the face of it is very simple, but is, despite or indeed because of its simplicity, able to be host to incredibly complicated feelings. I'm not against fancy pants language in poems. Dylan Thomas, uh, Hopkins, I mean, I, their best poems I absolutely love. But I do feel drawn to simplicity in, actually, in all, or seeming simplicity in all art, um, and perhaps especially in poems. So that as though the surface, as though the articulation is a kind of clear surface through which you look into the complex emotions that are going on underneath. I mean, I'm about to say something which I'm afraid I've said before, so it has a slightly glib aspect to it, but it works for me, and you'll immediately see what I mean, that I've always wanted to write poems myself which look like a glass of water but turn out to be gin. I mean, that is my ideal. And I think Hardy's poems do do, do that. They look like glasses of water but they turn out to be gin. Um, 
And that was a very important lesson for me. I think poems, I mean, they do exist at an angle to life. They hit life at a strange angle. That's how they managed to tell us something that we've forgotten, or in some sense didn't know in the first place. But their simplicity, as I say, can allow them to belong in it, in, in this very nourishing, consoling, exciting, stimulating, astonishing way. Let's have one more. Yes. You very correctly say that the arts can have a profound effect upon us. And um, to quote uh, one amusing artist who was treated abominably in England, and he said, um, everybody knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. That's right. And you are now in the city of London, which no doubt knows the price of everything. Yeah. Um, or, or but they it? are bedeviled. <laughs> <laughs> but you also mentioned that Jesus had some uh, interesting parables to uh, recount. And before I say that one, um, for me, England is an, an utterly unique place. Utterly unique. I've lived in several parts of the world. I've always come back to England. Mm -hmm. It is utterly unique. And um, in Matthew 22, 21, which I'm sure you know backwards, do you? I probably will if you remind me what it is. <laughs> um, I, mean, I do know says, the Bible quite well. Render unto Caesar that which is yes, Caesar's. Of course. And I'm yes. sure you can finish it off. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> and unto God that which is God's. Yes. And, and we all, um, what is marvelous about this country is that when it broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, the idea was that man stood face to face with his maker. He didn't have to go through an intermediary. Mm. And... Um, I feel that we are at a turning point from which there may be no retreat. And I'm much more somber than you are. I feel pretty somber. Not as somber as I am. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're heading in the right direction, I have to say. Um, I, I, but, I've, I mean, to, to distinguish between your somberness and, and mine, I mean, what I do feel, I mean, people always say never waste a crisis, don't they? Um, it's a good idea, never waste a crisis. I mean, there, there is a sort of crisis going on now here, I think. I agree, I think the UK, England, has um, extraordinary things to be said to its credit. Um, but because of all the stuff that I touched on, because of the stuff which I needn't rehearse now about our big institutions looking so tarnished in a, in a way that they haven't, frankly, ever done before, um, because of the sort of sense of crumbling more or less everywhere we, whichever direction we look at. That is all extremely depressing and, and likely to make anybody feel somber. But there is an opportunity, as I said right at the beginning, to, to think, how do we want to live? If we can't, if we don't trust this stuff anymore, um, even when we've got it kind of back on track, it's not going to be the grand and unimpeachable thing that it ever was before, at least not in our lifetimes, because we're going to remember how tarnished it has been. If we can't have an army anymore, for good and for ill, no doubt, um, or at least not on the scale that we've had in the past, if we can't define ourselves in the way that we've often defined ourselves on the, wor on the world stage by the means that we've used in the last hundred and some, well, and more years, that leaves an opportunity, it seems to me, for us to think about, well, as I say, how we want to live. What do we value? What is the quality of our lives going to be? And my plea, as you saw early in the middle part of my lecture, really was that some of the people who we've elected to, um, in one way or another, organize our lives for us, if they were able, I think that if they were able to make manifest the values that I was trying to identify in my talk, part of the way that they spoke about things, um, and indeed legislate, in quite practical ways to give people the opportunity to enjoy them. That would be a very good thing to do in a very difficult time. And it wouldn't cost the earth either. In fact, it could be done for next to nothing. That's, that seems to me the great opportunity of now. Perhaps that's time, a moment to stop. Well, you're very welcome to. I mean, I'm not about to rush off. Um, but anyway, that's what I think. I think there is a great opportunity to do something to allow something noble into our life now. And I would uh, very much like to see it happen. I'm going to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. For more 
information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.